Foo shamanism is a term that's about as over as the term pagan, which is to say it covers a lot of diverse ground. Sometimes the word is used to even label stuff that probably doesn't belong in that category, and people are constantly having debates over the scope of the term. And since that's been on my mind, the scope of Wu shamanism is what I want to ramble about. Li Zihou is a Chinese philosopher and historian who makes a distinction between what he calls Wu shamanistic historical traditions and superstitious Wu shamanism. And he's by no means alone. There's a growing trend in Chinese academia to conceptualize a distinction between Wu shamanism as a historical tradition indigenous to China and Wu Shu. Wu Shu. What is Wushu? How do you translate that word into English? The difficulty with trying to adequately translate concepts from Chinese to English cannot and should not be underestimated. What is Wushu and therefore what is this one facet of Wu shamanism? So a while back, my mom was telling me how she now tells all my aunties, and by aunties, I mean like actual biological family relative aunties and also just like my mom's friends, that I'm a Xiangu. And I was like, mom, what's that? You mean like the immortal He Xiangu? She's like, no, no, a Xiangu. A Xiangu is someone who uses magical powers and her close connection to gods and goddesses to help people. And I was like, just kind of half-heartedly participating in this conversation with her. So I was kind of like, oh, oh, you mean Xiangu is like a Wu Po, so Wu Shu. Mom lost her mind. She was like, no, not the same. No, 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 you do not practice Wu Shu. And here I was like, um, yeah, yeah, I do. Wu Shu, if you do a literal translation, means the practical methods and techniques of Wu shamanism. I would define Wu Shu as a body of faith-based practices that on some fundamental level as its premise is about mediating between worlds and specifically worlds of spirits. And then it's Wu specifically when it's a practice indigenous to the Yellow River civilizations. But back to mom. So according to my mom and people from my mother's and my grandmother's generation, Wu Shu is associated with baneful magic. In contrast, culturally, in terms of their understanding, a Xiangu is someone who practices benevolent magic, who adopts an altruistic-based moral philosophy in terms of how they govern the type of magic they are willing to practice. Again, I would make the case that there is a significant generational difference here. If you speak to people my age who are active occult practitioners and native Chinese or Taiwanese, by and large, Wu Shu is no longer seen as negative. But practitioners from my mom's and grandmother's generations, they wouldn't self-identify as a Wu or Wu Po, the feminine of Wu. They would say they're a Shen Han for the gendered male or Shen Po for the gendered female or even Shen Tong, spirit mediums. But Wu Po might have been seen as a little bit more derogatory or they would have wanted to distance themselves from Wu Po, from Wu and Wu Shu. Okay, but what is Wu Shu, at least to me? And I do want to be a little bit bolder and expand beyond personal gnosis and see if I can even dare make a general statement about defining the scope of Wu Shu or the practices of Wu shamanism. I've been reflecting on the implications of why in Mandarin Chinese, I would claim something like, yes, yes, I practice Wu Shu which translates to techniques and methods of Wu shamanism. But I would never directly or outright say the equivalent in English. So I would never say I practice Wu shamanism. I would definitely, definitely never say I am a shaman. Interesting, right? So I would say it in Chinese, I practice Wu Shu, but I would never say it as translated into English based on our current established agreed upon translations. So that got me thinking, why? And the answer is pretty simple, I think. It's because the cultural implications are totally different. There are fairly well-established, defined parameters for Wu Shu, and specifically there are eight methods, eight practices or Shu of Wu shamans. One, incantations, mantra recitations, dharanis, prayer, and sacrifice. 
it's this idea that because of who you are or just, yeah, who you are, you have the ear of the gods. And so through incantations and through the use of words, your words hold more power than the average Joe Schmo's words. So your words will reach the ears of the gods. Therefore, number two, petitions to gods for divine justice. Divine beings from the spirit world will hear your call and come to earth and exact justice on your behalf or as you have petitioned for. Three, divination, the ability to interpret signs and omens. I would categorize feng shui here also, hear me out, I'm going to use the word feng shui a lot more loosely, because feng shui at its heart is being able to read the signs and omens of a place. Four, warding off evil and warding off all forms of illness, specifically spiritual sicknesses. Five, exorcisms and soul retrieval rituals. Six, food talismans and spellcrafting. Seven, metaphysical uses of herbs. Actually, one of the eight, as it was explicitly defined in Mandarin Chinese, is Hu Dao, or poison magic. So for seven, I did make it light and fluffier, where originally it's Gu, or forms of poison magic, whereas I'm expanding that out to be a little bit more benign and characterizing number seven, or practice number seven of Wu shamanism as the metaphysical uses of herbs. And eight, finally, mediumship, the ability to communicate and negotiate with spirit entities. As a general principle, indigenous religions of China are described as Wu shamanistic historical traditions. The I Ching Book of Changes is described by many Chinese philosophers and cultural anthropologists, such as Li Zihou, as shamanistic in origin. When we talk about Wu as shamanistic historical traditions, this is the shamanism indigenous to China that dates back to 5000 BC, to the Yangshao. Early Wu shamans would use effigies of animals, both real and mythical, as their spirit helpers, such as dragon spirits, crow spirits, deer, and so on. In fact, your magical powers were sourced from your close attunement to a particular animal spirit. Drumming, rhythm, music, and dance were methods for journeying to other realms to make those spirit contacts. And your spirit animal was a form of guardian protecting you during your journeys from world to world. Actually, fun fact, in Chinese history, the invention of the drum is credited to the Wu shamans. Confucianism and Taoism are birthed from Wu shamanistic historical traditions, which is why there is a growing movement of historians and anthropologists who are now asserting that the whole of Chinese culture is premised on two particular cornerstones. The first is Wu shamanistic historical traditions, Wu shamanism, and two, the second one is the clan system. So Wu shamanism is as important as the clan system to Chinese culture and history. But then during the Han Dynasty, this is around 200 BC to 200 AD, Confucianism as an institution and Wu shamanism were at odds, vying for sociopolitical power. And it was also during the Han Dynasty that enters a new third player in all of this, Buddhism. And Buddhism was beginning to gain a much greater foothold in China as an institution. So Buddhism, along with Confucianist humanism and rational philosophy, rose in prominence while the ecstatic dance rituals and spirit mediumship of the Wu declined among the Han ethnic group, though Wu shamanism did continue to thrive in other Chinese ethnic groups. Oh yeah, there are at least 56 ethnic groups in China. Currently, the Han ethnic group dominates, but throughout Chinese history, it hasn't always been the Han that were in power. In fact, for a lot of Chinese history, the Han ethnic group was suppressed. When you get to the Song Dynasty, which in Europe was the High Middle Ages or the Medieval Period, Taoist ceremonial magicians were saying, we are not Wu. They were disclaiming their association or origins and heritage with the Wu. And again, that was just that sociopolitical need to distinguish themselves and separate themselves out from what was now a declining practice, which is Wu ecstatic shamanism. So you have Taoist ceremonial magicians who are disclaiming their connection to Wu shamanism, even though what they're doing is basically Wu shamanism. They're just repackaging it and giving it a new name. And all because of sociopolitical reasons. Buddhism, and in particular, esoteric Buddhism from Vajrayana schools were really popular among the Chinese elite. 
And so in a way, arguably, esoteric Buddhism replaced what Wu shamanism had previously filled. But forms of Mahayana and Vajrayana Buddhism were syncretized with that heritage, that indigenous heritage of Wu shamanism. And what I mean by the practice of esoteric Buddhism as it was found historically and culturally in China is mandalas instead of food talismans and forms of meditation and hand mudras. Buddhist-oriented magical practices and ceremonial rituals instead of the ceremonial dances of Wu shamanism, recitation of Dharanis as a form of magical practice, channeling bodhisattvas instead of indigenous gods, and the concept of sourcing your power from Buddhas and bodhisattvas through mantras instead of through animal spirits. Random personal observation, it is interesting to me how much more of a focus there is on female or feminine presenting bodhisattvas in esoteric Buddhism as compared to the practice of exoteric religious Buddhism. For example, the stronger focus on Zun Ti Pusa or Marichi Moli Zutian. It's almost like we're trying to find Buddhist equivalents to the indigenous Ma Zu, Shi Wang Mu, or Zhou Tian Xuan Yu. The present-day real-world result of this history is that, in practice, Chinese occultism is a mixture of Wu shamanism, Taoist mysticism, and esoteric Buddhism. What I've observed and find fascinating is that from a Western paradigm, there's this compulsion to try and categorize, separate, or parse out what is what, what came from what, and to put on nice, clean labels on everything. Whereas from an Eastern paradigm, most native East Asian occult practitioners I know seem to sit very comfortably in that space of eclectic mixing where there isn't as strong of a concern as to what is Buddhist and what is strictly Taoist. Is it Confucian influenced or having to feel the need to deconstruct Confucianism from Chinese occultism? And so sometimes I wonder if even this asking of the question and feeling the compulsion to define a scope for Wu shamanism, is that the Western paradigm in me speaking? I'm also still processing my mom's characterization of me as a Xian Gu. There was this family reunion moment very recently when everyone, all my relatives, including my father-in-law, he was present, pulled out their wallets and their handbags and showed a food talisman that they keep with them at all times that I had crafted for them. And then my mom exclaimed, see, you're a Xian Gu, but isn't that Wu Shu?